message of the day. Okay. When you get an opportunity in this game, you make a play. Yeah. The playmakers on three. One, two, three. Playmakers. Touchdown, Kansas City. The Chiefs are right in the thick of it, baby. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this training camp edition of Defending the Kingdom. Mitch Holters with you, voice of the Chiefs, along with the man we call the shop, the barbershop, the Spider-Man, and senior team reporter Matt Stat himself, Matt McMullen. Okay, there's nothing better than doing a Defending the Kingdom podcast from training camp. The Nats sound of the mowers. we got the wind going on. It has been a great start to this camp in St. Joe, and I'm going to ask you two guys, if you're seeing and hearing what I'm seeing and hearing, and that is a vibe around this team. This is a team that is hyper-focused and in many ways rebooting. Well, my thought here, Mitch, is in a lot of ways, this team has accomplished so much over the last several years. Four straight AFC title game appearances. They won two of them uh, and, of course, won a Super Bowl. So this team has accomplished a lot. And you wonder when a team has accomplished all of this, what do they have to keep motivating them? Well, I think there's some disrespect out there from the national perception of who the best teams in the NFL are this season. And while for the most part, they block out all the outside noise, uh, it's hard not to hear that sometimes. And I think throughout OTAs and mini camp, and now to begin this training camp, we've seen a team that's excited for this upcoming season and they're motivated to go out there and prove that this is the best team in football. It's fun to see. The vibe re-energized, more energy, a youth movement, however you want to call it, Brett Veach has pressed the hard reset um, he's brought in some energy, some excitement, some guys that can go sideline to sideline on the defensive side of the ball, and a bunch of playmakers to help Pat Mahomes continue to meticulate that ball down the field with MVS and also Juju. So I'm excited to see all three of these phases come together, but I'm really excited to see the hard work, the blood, sweat, and tears, all the bricks be put into place as we build that kingdom, build that fort up for the upcoming 2022 season. Travis Kelsey had his best spring and summer in his 10 years in this league. I ask him. I go, dude, are you trying to make the team? Because it looks like, because he was given all this extra effort. Mm. He goes, I'm re-energized. I've rediscovered my love for football. And he goes, I'm ticked off. Yeah. I'm kind of ticked off. Like everybody thinks the Chiefs are going to be 2-15. and 15. Uh, A reminder, our podcast, Defending the Kingdom, from here at Training Camp in St. Joe, uh, brought to you by NFLSundayTicket.tv. Uh, football fans, with NFLSundayTicket.tv, you can watch your favorite football team no matter where you live. And we know in Defending the Kingdom, you live on all seven continents. That's because NFLSundayTicket.tv gives you every live, out-of-market game every Sunday afternoon, streamed right to your favorite device. Visit NFLSundayTicket.tv and order it today. Eligibility restrictions, other conditions apply. Only one game may be uh, accessed remotely. Available games based on device location. We have seen people, including a family that comes to camp every year. They're a missionary family from South America. Now you have a chance uh, to follow the Chiefs every week uh, with this NFL Sunday Ticket TV. Okay, quickly around the world, let's go. Uh, we're now the epicenter of the Chiefs Kingdom <laughs> moves for three weeks to right here at this spot at Missouri Western State University in St. Joe. But that means the world revolves around here. What do we have around the world? So 13 names and places, as always, in honor of 13 seconds. So first we have Todd in Black Diamond, Washington. He says he's infiltrating Seahawks territory with the Chiefs flag. Love that. Uh, we've got Rhonda in Williamsburg, Virginia. You like that one, huh? Anything Ooh. VA, baby. Yeah, her and her husband. Been married, though. Mm. Well, they're originally from Missouri, but never made it to a game, ever. But now they're going to the Bills game this year here in Kansas City, and they can't wait. Love right. it. Yep. Um, we've got Dwayne and his dad, Robin. They're in Salt Lake City, but they're originally from Rock Springs, Wyoming. Uh, his dad is the whole reason he's a fan. Wanted to give him a shout-out here on DTK here today. Uh, we've got Jeremy in Honolulu. Renee in Union City, New Jersey. Michael in Tampa. He predicts that Raymond James Stadium is going to be flooded with red and gold in week four. Love that. We're going to board that ship. We're taking yeah. that ship <laughs> <Yeah>. over. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, Little John Paul Jones. <laughs> We've got a listener who grew up in North Kansas City and went to William Jewell. But this is a new one. Uh, he now lives in North Pole, Alaska. Yes. I know. Still need Antarctica, but North Pole, Alaska, is, that's pretty good. This yes, might be so. our furthest north location, right? Yeah. There's nothing but Point Barrow that's north of North Pole. So yeah. way to go. So yeah. Got him. That's awesome. Love it. Um, we've got Brad Simcox. He's one of those Arrowhead Abroad. Uh, he's been here before. I've met Brad. Um, he wants us to send him a Defending the Kingdom shirt in the United Kingdom. So we're still working on that. We're working on that it. That idea is in motion. It's going to happen. Yep. Uh, Enrique is listening in Bloomington, Minnesota, but he's originally from Mexico City. Pretty cool. Uh, Wesley is from Olathe, um, but they're claiming Briarwood as B-Dub Kingdom. 
<laughs> it's awesome. Uh, Matt is from Southern California. He's a third-generation Chiefs fan. His dad and his grandparents lived in Kansas City. He doesn't, but he's continuing the Chiefs' legacy. Love it's it. It's pretty cool. Love all those stories. Those generational uh, transfers yeah, are great. it's the best. Uh, we've got Skyler in South Korea and then Terry in Bangkok. And lastly, I met a fan 20 minutes ago who asked if I could wish Tracy Gage a happy birthday on August 1st. So happy birthday to you, Tracy. And where does Tracy Gage live? Didn't get that information, oh, okay. but it's her birthday on August 1st. It could be so, anywhere in the world yeah. that we know because of defending <laughs> the kingdom, maybe North Pole, Alaska. Maybe. Well, let's uh, – so many times through this spring and summer, this goes back to our Vibe discussion to open the podcast. I have been in private and public conversations – saying, well, if the Chiefs, if the defense, if, well, if the defense, if the defense, this starts a series of defending the kingdoms, we're going to call them, if the defense. And part one will be the defensive backs. But the three of us have heard this. Everybody kind of dissing the defense, if the defense, if they could. So the defensive backs are well, we'll start, but let's just get a global uh, thought here because, Matt, your discussion about disrespect and the vibe on this team Almost starts with the defense, Sean, because everybody's thinking, gosh, the defense hasn't been any good for five years. They were number one or three in the league last year in the final eight games of the year in points allowed. Yeah, it's how you finish and how you start the season. I um, mean, I think the defensive coordinator and our the players know that. It's a, it's a building. It's a building up to playing playoff football that most fans that watch stats don't really account for. They want to know overall where do you um, uh, list, where do you rank defensively as far as points given up, points allowed, and all that kind of stuff. Well, as we know from the playoffs, uh, um, the number one points allowed defense gave up in 13 seconds <laughs> a field goal that went into overtime where we won the game. So if that's the type of defense we're trying to aim for, that's not the defense I want. I want a team that's going to rise to the occasion that's going to make big stops, make big plays, put quarterbacks on the ground, make pick sixes, um, play consistently um, um, sound football throughout the season. And to do that, sometimes you got to take a couple stumbles and falls in the first couple weeks. It's a building block. It's a building pl process. But you build upon some good days, some, some bad days. But what you want to do is make sure at the end of the season you're playing playoff football and that's accountable um, that, that's fast quick that's making plays all over the field and I believe we have the personnel at all three levels to do that yeah we're going to get into that very thought uh, over the next several defending the kingdoms but you can also go back you can find our live stream that we did here in camp archive with the three of us and we also get into that of the very thing that you mentioned Matt if the defense if the defense um, defensively we have seen this defense do great things at times um, but you've heard the same thing. Everybody's thinking, gosh, the defense won't be any good. What's interesting about this year is we said goodbye to a lot of players that were on this defense for a long time. And they made great contributions to this team. But we've turned the page now, and there's been an infusion of youth and talent and athleticism on this defense. So outside of just defensive backs, all players on this defense, I'm going to list off all of these names. These guys are all either 25 years old or younger. Nick Bolton, Willie Gay, Legereus Sneed, George Karloftis, Rashad Fitton, Joshua Williams, Brian Cook, Leo Chanel, Jalen Watson. There's more. Think of all those players. All of those guys have made plays in this camp. All of those guys have a chance to make a real impact on this team this year, and they're all super young, and they're excited for the opportunity to just be in the NFL and to compete on this defense. And while there's been struggles in the past at times, we've been seeing these guys who are young rise to the occasion, and they're not playing like players who are young. They look like players that have been around a long time, and that's very encouraging. That, to me, is the biggest point of those guys you mentioned because you think, wow, that defense is so young. We have seen their athletic ability, but even more than that, what I've noticed from these guys is their emotional maturity yes. and their mental maturity to start their careers in many cases or expand their careers. That is very prevalent on this team, and that's what the rest of the league does not see. You look at the number and go, he's 24, he's 23. Well, sometimes you can be 23 and act like you're 10. <laughs> sometimes you can be 23 and act like you're a seven-year veteran. Justin Reed comes to mind. So let's get into the defensive backs here. There are 18 uh, in this camp. Rashad Fenton's on PUP right now, physically unable to perform. Uh, we've seen him make plays, and maybe the biggest play you've forgotten about in Super Bowl 54 when he corralled Jimmy Garoppolo on the first defensive stop. Uh, that led to the Avalanche and the Chiefs winning that game. Uh, but let's go into this team now. So let's jump into the other 1,700. It's, it, however you depend where you put Nazi Johnson as a safety or a corner, it's split almost down the middle, 9-9. Nine, nine. But let's go into the safeties because this is where I'm really excited about this team. Shop, we'll start with you. 
what a Justin Reed can do. Uh, what a one Thornhill, who's back to maybe the one Thornhill of 2019 or his days at Virginia, uh, can do. And then some of the younger guys. Well, so, you know, I mean, Juan Thornhill being from UVA, being from my hometown, obviously I took a special interest in that young man uh, when he first entered the kingdom and when I had a phenomenal rookie year. Um, and then in year two, obviously, that, you know, that injury um, kind of, sh you know, shortened that, 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 that second year or that end of the first year, which led into year two coming, coming back off an injury, just uh, really didn't seem like the same explosive player I saw um, coming out of college. And so it was almost a, a, a identity crisis. Like, what are we going to see this year? And I mean, I know a lot of people don't believe in going out on social media and talking your own self, patting yourself up, on, up or talking yourself up. But I was, I was encouraged to see him do that. Um, he promised the media. He went out there and said, "Look, you're going to see a different Juan Thorn here. You're going to be seeing a guy that's going to go uh, sideline to sideline, making plays in the box." Uh, from a deep safety position, uh, a, a playmaker, it, it, it can do it all over the field. And that's the guy that I knew we drafted um, uh, when he first got here. And so to see him back to his own, uh, that, that, that natural swagger that he had when I, when, I, when I saw him come out, I'm so delighted to see that we're going to get that version of that young man coming back um, with a little chip on his shoulder. Again, uh, a little sign of disrespect is a good thing when you use it in a positive way. And I think a lot of our players, for different reasons, have been disrespected in the public eye um, around the league as far as what this team defense um, is, is kind of on paper uh, scheduled to do. And I think the guys are using it in a way to really motivate themselves and have come into camp mentally and physically prepared to go out there and dominate. Matt, you've spent a lot of time with Justin Reed since he signed here as a free agent. To me, this might be one of the more sneaky, not just for the Chiefs kingdom, but in the entire National Football League. Not just his ability, but that maturity and his ability to take responsibility beyond himself. The tricky part of the NFL offseason calendar is the free agency stuff all happens way back in March. And I think we kind of forget almost like, oh, yeah, Justin Reed's here. <laughs> And if you're ever wondering what's this defense going to look like this season, just listen to a Justin Reed presser, and you're going to leave that feeling really good about yes. what you heard. That guy's awesome. He's a leader. He's insightful. And he's also one of the best young safeties in all of football. And I mentioned all the young players on this defense. They're looking at him. They're looking at Juan Thornhill as well, but they're looking at a guy like Justin Reed, a veteran that comes in here, signs a big contract. They're looking at him for direction. And the beautiful thing about Justin Reed is he wants to give that direction. So he spoke to the media a few days ago, and I came away with just a bunch of notes about things that really impressed me about him. First of all, you have uh, tape on your wrists, obviously, right? He writes notes every single practice about things he wants to emphasize or get better at. So uh, a few days ago, it was communicate on one wrist and then backpedal and finish at the ball on the other one. Really, really cool that he was doing that. Other players will see that and go, that's a guy that got a big contract and yet still has to remind himself about little things when he's out there. That's leading by example there. But also, Justin was talking about how the defense has gotten off to a slow start in recent years. He took ownership of that, even though he wasn't even here. He wasn't on those defenses. That wasn't his fault, but he took ownership of it and said, I don't want that to happen this year. From week one, we want to go out there and dominate. We want to be an attitude defense that when we go out there, offenses know that we're going to bring it every single time. We don't want to take some time to figure out, you know, how's this defense going to look. From day one, he wants to be that dominant defense. And, of course, there's going to be growing pains. A lot of new players, a lot of young players on this defense. You expect that. But the mentality is the important thing. And every single day, he's been coming out here and saying we are only as good as tomorrow. One more thing on him. Obviously, once again, a big-name free agent, has all the talent in the world, right? So he can come out here and just do his thing and ball out, right? No, but you don't want that. You want your guys to buy into Steve Spagnuolo's system, and it's possible that older guys might not want to do that because they're like, I know what works. I don't need to do that. But he picked off a pass during seven-on-seven -seven drills in the end zone a few days ago, and he was asked about it after practice, and he said, I'm just playing the defense. That's where I'm supposed to be. I'm bought into this defense, and I was rewarded with an interception. Just got to catch the ball when I'm there. And once again, if a veteran is saying that, if you're a young player like Brian Cook or Joshua Williams, you're like, I'm going to buy into this defense too. If he's doing it, I'm going to do it. And for all those reasons, I could go on and on. Justin Reed has, has just been great for this defense, and I can't wait to see it translate to the field on game day. Wouldn't be stunned some days a U.S. senator from Louisiana. <laughs> uh, but honestly, he is the exhibit A. When I talked about emotional and mental maturity mm -hmm. at a young age, 
He is, he is the guy to me. Uh, you mentioned Juan Thornhill. When he was healthy, go back, 57 tackles, three interceptions. You remember the pick six against the Raiders. Then he tore his ACL in the final regular season game mm. and had to set out that run to the Super Bowl 54 championship. I saw him in the locker room after the game, and he was happy. But he, was, he goes, man, I, I just didn't feel like I was a part of it. Well, now he's, he's as excited as he's been since he signed with or was drafted by this team. A couple more safeties I want to mention here, and then we're going to move on to the corners uh, in this episode of Defending the Kingdom called If the Defense, Part 1 with the DBs, and that are a young safety and a guy that the Chiefs another sneaky pickup uh, in free agency. The sneaky pickup is Deion Bush from the uh, Chicago Bears, a four-core special teams guy. Uh, with the Bears, he had 760 uh, de- Uh, Sorry, 700 uh, special teams plays, but 360 on defensive uh, plays and was productive, including two interceptions. And then Brian Cook. This is the favorite guy of Matt McCullen in the whole <laughs> yes. draft. And when we drafted him, we were having our we had our own little draft room. We were going crazy. Let's <laughs> let's start with you, Shop, with these two guys. A veteran in Bush, four core teams guy that could play when the Chiefs go to extra safeties. We see Spags do that a lot. He'll play nickel and dime with three safeties, which teams don't normally do. And then a guy like Brian Cook, and save some of the Brian Cook for Matt because it'll take the rest of the podcast. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a name when you talk about Brian Cook. Um, he reminds me a lot, and in, 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 in apologize, but he reminds me like a, a Brian Dawkins. So I'm gonna right. put that that image in your in your in your in your mind and let you mull over that while I talk about uh, Bush because that's a that's a name that when you throw it out there and you put uh, a Brian Dawkins image in your head and you think about what Spags has done over over the years. With a player like Brian Dawkins, with that hitability and that 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 ferocity, and to be able to just lay lay out receivers the way he has, to be an inbox, outbox, free safety, the versatility of a player like that, that's what jumped into my mind when I saw his highlight film uh, when we drafted him. But with Bush, Bush is the guy that's going to give Coach Tobe, uh, uh, he's going to sleep a little easier. Mm-hmm. He's going to be able to go go ahead and know he can put that guy at gunner, put him on the wing, put him at the up back. He's going to be a guy that really. Uh, absorbs our special teams and probably will end up being one of the special teams captains as we go into the season. Um, it, you just you need four or five guys on your team that know that, yeah, if I don't start on the offensive or defensive side of the ball, I am just as important to this team because I'm a starter in the third phase, which is special teams. And so he's going to be what we've, we've noted, a tip of the spear guy. Um, he's going to be the first uh, first one in, first one out. He'll be a guy that you know is studying long, studying um, um, tendencies on special teams account for this young man to make multiple game-changing plays in that third phase, which is special teams, and not to say that he can't back up one of our safeties and be very um, um, integral in our normal defensive downs as a solid back-end safety also. And Bush started – I'm sorry, not Bush, but uh, Cook started his career in college at Howard, a very highly regarded HBCU, mm. before transferring to that – Awesome secondary of the Cincinnati Bearcats. Yes, you jump in here with Cook because you sent me the video and you go, have you watched Cook yet? I said, no, but I will. And then I couldn't take my eyes off him. Mm. I mean, you were spotting this guy all along. Are you guys are ready for my Brian Cook monologue now? Go for it. Right. <laughs> the date was like April 3rd or April 4th, and I texted you while watching Safety Film, as you just alluded to, have you watched Brian Cook? And the next thing I said was, this guy reminds me of Cam Chancellor. Mm. That's a lofty comp. That's tough. But he did, just watching his film, all right? Fast forward to after we had drafted him. Hey, we're throwing him. out Brian Dawkins. Go ahead and yeah, throw yeah, out why not? Chancellor if you want. We're at Draft Fest, and I'm talking to him a little bit, and I'm like, just curious, who was your favorite player growing up? Who was the guy that you try to go out there and emulate on the field? And he's like, honestly, Cam Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, my man. <laughs> I said this about you weeks ago. I love his uh, combination of being able to play the run and the pass. So at Cincinnati last year, 451 snaps in coverage and 444 snaps against the run. He was one of only four defensive backs in the FBS to tally 95 tackles and 10 passes defensed last season. Did a little bit of everything. Think of how Spags runs this defense. Think of Daniel Sorensen's role as a hybrid linebacker safety out there a lot in big nickel. Brian Cook was born for that role. Yes, he was. Now, I don't know how much Spags will use him early on, but I know that as long as Brian can pick up the playbook, he physically can handle that position. Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited to see how he can do uh, over the course of this season. I am confident he's going to make some plays for us this year. And Deion Bush, kind of a sneaky offseason signing. I think he's one of those guys that if you come up to training camp, 
and you follow the Chiefs but haven't been following every single signing, you'll be like, who's 26 out there on defense? Yep. That's Deion Bush. Uh, and I think he can make some plays for us this year as well, both on defense in uh, those big safety looks as maybe an extra safety or also on special teams, as we've talked about, because you need core special teamers. One thing we haven't talked about much is a lot of players that played a lot of special team snaps for this team last year are no longer here. Yeah. And you want guys who are experienced in that role because the margin of error in the NFL is so slight that if you have a mistake on special teams, that's the difference between winning and losing. Especially Ask the Packers. Yeah. Ask the Packers in the playoffs. Exactly. Hello. You want Hello. experienced players that know what they're doing, can go out and execute Coach Tobe's vision on special teams, and Deion Bush can do that. Yes, I had that very discussion with Coach Tobe and Andy Hill just the other day about all the guys that have to be replaced. But then it goes back to the athleticism we've talked about, uh, which this is a much more athletic team. And that usually leads to good special teams, even though they may, won't be perfect all along. All right, quickly, uh, the rest of the safeties here. I'll just mention him. Nazi Johnson, count him as a safety or corner. Thundering yeah. herd. Yeah, <laughs> there he is, Marshall. Uh, Zane Anderson played some last year. Chris Lamonds uh, back with this team. Uh, could be a corner, could be safety. Yeah. Awesome in special teams. Uh, then also Devin Key and Nasir Greer. Now let's jump into the corners. Just a few minutes here as we close out this podcast. But the corners, this is where, again, you talk about teams co or fans coming out to camp going, who's 26? They're going, well, who's 23 <laughs> at corner? Uh, rookie Joshua Williams there. Trent McDuffie at the other corner. We know that LJ Sneed could be probably top three slot corners in the league. So let's start with you, Shop. With this cornerback crew, again, a redo, reboot, but I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. Yeah, I, just, I, I hope that – the mentality from a cornerback is to use training camp to build some confidence. I want my safeties to know when I'm inside a lineman and I got help to the outside, I'm going to use you. When I'm outside a lineman and you're coming down as a whole safety, I'm going to I'm going to stay on my leverage and my man coverage throughout the echo of the whistle. There's not going to be a point where I let up. I'm not going to glance back at the quarterback to to um, um, and abandon you as a as a as a, as a cornerback. I'm going to play my position the way it's supposed to be played. And if I can build that confidence up in my secondary, it allows the safeties to be free rangers to be able to show disguises and coverages because I know that you know what you're supposed to do. Um, and that's the one thing in training camp, you build that confidence in each other. And then as far as mirability, you got to be able to stay in front of these receivers and not let them go up the field. You got to prevent them from getting in their route to give our pass rush, to give the pass rushers and the green dogs and the linebackers time to get to the quarterback and make that uh, quarterback a little bit uneasy, get him off his spot. So it's, it goes hand in hand. The pass rush and the coverage goes hand in hand, but it comes down to community communication, trust, and then accountability. You got to know your alignment, your assignment, and then you got to go out and execute. So I'm looking forward to seeing these young guys getting put in some base coverage if needed to, but then allow their raw skills to take advantage. Allow their raw skills to show what it is to be young and aggressive. And, and even if you got to make some mistakes, this is the time where you cut your teeth. This is the time where you learn your lessons as a young corner in the league about how does it feel to, to try to climb up a, a six-foot four wide receiver that has an amazing uh, catch radius and how does it feel to go against a 4-2 Sky Moore going down the field uh, test your test your lim limits um, um, push your limits fail a little bit it'll make you a much better player and then make you a much more consistent corner come game day during the season especially with the teams the Chiefs will yes. play this year in the AFC and the six games in the AFC West you just described a Mike Williams <laughs> you just described guys quarterbacks in this league that want to hit you at that third yes. level Okay, Joshua Williams, Division Two. To me, I, I lose sleep over a lot of stuff. <laughs> if I'm losing sleep over these guys, it's because I'm excited and, and, and not anxiety. Mm. Uh, just because I've seen more than I thought I would see at this point. And with Trent McDuffie, we know about Snead in the slot. Uh, but these corners, it is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be instant oatmeal. But I think the upside is, is, since Andy's been here, I'm not so sure there hasn't been this much upside at corner. You know what makes it easier to cover a 6'4 receiver? Is if you're 6'3", like that Joshua helps. Williams is. Yes. It certainly helps. And the Chiefs over the years just haven't had a lot of very super tall corners. That's fine. I mean, they've made up for it with athleticism. But this offseason, there seemed to be an emphasis on trying to get some longer corners in here. Uh, and, for example, last year the Chiefs didn't have any corners over 6'2". They have three in this camp. Mm -hmm. Jalen Watson uh, out of Washington State, Lonnie Johnson from the Houston Texans, uh, and, of course, Joshua Williams out of Fayetteville State. And we were curious with Joshua coming from a smaller school, how quickly can he adapt to NFL football? And we were watching OTAs, Mitch, and we're like, oh, 
he can kind of hang right now, <laughs> like already. And let's see how it translates to camp, right? And so far, I mean, he's been looking really good. There's that video out there of Juju Smith-Schuster making a great catch deep down in the field. Uh, well, Joshua Williams, what made that play so great for Juju is Joshua Williams was in perfect coverage on that play. Yes. Juju just made a great play on the ball. Yep. But the important thing, Coach Reed has mentioned this, is that there are bodies on bodies. They're making it difficult on these receivers. Joshua Williams is a rookie in this league. He didn't play any caliber competition like this yes. when he was in school, and yet he is um, adapting already to the game. And it gets back to Justin Reed. Reed mentioned that Joshua is buying into the system, and that's all you can ask for from these players. Go out there, know the playbook, buy into the system, and just get better every single day. Work on your communication, grow as a defense together, and we're seeing that so far from him. One thing that not excites you about the opening game against Arizona is LJ Sneed. He has five career interceptions four against NFC teams. Just tell him he's going to play the NFC all the time, but he's a very good slot corner. You mentioned uh, Jalen Watson. You mentioned Lonnie Johnson. I'm just going to mention the other corners here. Uh, DiCaprio Boodle, uh, former Nebraska Cornhusker, played some with this team last year. Same with DeAndre Baker. Um, also a local kid. In fact, his mom, I sat with his mom on today's practice, uh, Brandon Dandridge, who played at Missouri Western right. here in Division II. That's awesome. Uh, so, neat kid. And then don't sleep on Rashad Fenton. He's on P PUP oh, right yeah. now, but he made the play to start the Avalanche in Super Bowl 54 when he contained Jimmy Garoppolo on a third down scramble. Uh, and so, Fenton's made big plays for this team. So, overall, as we close it, uh, just this thought on if the defense and the DBs and where you want to see this camp go from you two guys and we'll wrap it up. Well, I'll start, I mean, listen, where you started at didn't have anything to do with your destination. I started at University of Richmond Small School spiders. 10 years later. Yeah, them spiders. Uh, but 10 years later, um, had a great career in the NFL. And I look forward to the Fentons and the Williams and all these under uh, underappreciated, underdrafted guys. If you if you got some air and opportunity right here on the field, this is where you prove that you belong, and this is where you accelerate and, and go out there and make plays. So if you ask me what if, um, I, I'll say the defense, why not? Why not us? Why not now? Why not right now be one of the top defenses in the league? And it's not about doing anything special, anything unique, except for playing hard-nosed, uh, smart football, being accountable to your teammates, being in the position you know you're supposed to be in, and then finishing the play. That is what you need from a player to player to build some confidence in one another. And then, like uh, Reed said, we got to have great communication. We got to backpedal when needed. But then we got to be able to finish the play, finish the play strong. And if you can have that kind of trust in each other, it is no doubt we're not going to lose any sleep for this 2022 defense. Yeah, and I just say, you know, it's only day four for the veterans, it's day seven for the rookies, but I'm super encouraged by what I've seen out of this defense so far. And when you have so many young players, to see them out there, being on their spot, following their assignments correctly, as yes. far as we can tell, and making plays, it's just really exciting. Now, the next big test is the pads come on on Monday. August 1st, the pads will be on, and we'll learn something new about <laughs> these guys when they're actually playing football out there. But at least so far, so good for these DBs. I'll buy you both lunch if any of these guys we mentioned shy away when the pads are on. I think it's going to be just the opposite. <laughs> Defense, I've talked to Steve Spagnuolo many times in just private discussions. Defense has changed in the NFL. The days of the 85 Bears and the 2000 Ravens are over. But if you have a defense that is explosive and can make turn on you plays, think about the Nick Bolton scoop and score against yes. Denver. Those are the defenses that are dangerous and win championships. The Chiefs are working on one right here. For Matt McMullen and Sean Barber, I'm Mitch Holtis. We'll have some more podcasts coming up. Just stay hooked in with us and training camp right here on Defending the Kingdom. Ten. Touchdown! Lock it down! And the celebration begins at Arrowhead.